Welcome back to our lecture introduction to quantum optics. Today we want to discuss again one of the beautiful experiments in quantum optics, in this case one of Serge Roche's experiments on how to detect a photon without actually destroying it. So why is this so amazing? Because typically when you measure a photon, let's see when you have a single photon impinging on a photodetector, you can absorb the photon and uh, that will create some electronic excitation leading to some click that you then detect and that will tell you that there was a photon in, for example, the radiation field mode you're putting your detector into. Now, of course, you know, after the detector made click, that photon is gone because you've absorbed it and transferred this excitation into an electronic degree of excitation. And the question is, can you actually detect this? Can you find a way to do this in a fashion where you do not destroy the photon, where we can know whether there is a photon or not without actually destroying it? And yes, this can indeed be done, as I'll show you now, and it can be done through interferometric means. And here's the actual experimental setup from Serge Aroche's group here, Gilles Nogue et al. in Nature, 1999. We've put the link also into the Coursera notes for you. So the setup consists of Rydberg atoms flying through a cavity setup and having a detector here. Now this setup here consists of three interaction zones. There's a first Ramsey zone, so-called Ramsey zone, where we can, for example, apply pi over 2 pulses on the I to G transition. So we have three levels in our atom that we're going to make use of, forming two two-level systems. One two-level system on the IG transition and another two-level system on the GE transition. So these Ramsey zones, R1 and R2, they just act on the IG transition and the cavity acts on the GE transition up here. So this is where the cavity acts. All right, so now let's go through the different steps of this interferometer and let's have a look of how we can see whether there is a photon or not in the cavity mode C without actually destroying that photon. Okay, so the first idea is that the first Ramsey zone brings our atom, for example, which is initially in a state G, into a coherent superposition of G and I. So this would just give us some coherent superposition of CG plus CI times I given by this first pi over 2 pulse that we're applying to the atom. Okay, so we've brought the atom into a coherent superposition state. Now, what next? In the next step, we're going to have the G atom interact with the cavity field. You see the I atom, if the atom is in the state I, it doesn't interact with the cavity because the cavity only is tuned to interact with an atom entering in either the G or the E state. If you're in the I state, you're so far off resonant that there's no interaction between our cavity light field and the atom to first approximation. So if you're in state G and there is a single photon in the cavity, we're going to tune the pulse area of that photon interacting with our atom to 2 pi, meaning that we're going to have the Rabi frequency of that single photon state that was just 2g times the interaction time of the atom with the light field that we tune to 2 pi. Okay, so we make that a 2 pi pulse if there's a single photon in the cavity. So what does that mean? So remember a 2 pi pulse means that if we enter in state g, we make a 2 pi pulse rotation, we come back out at state G again. But there's one important difference now. There's actually a phase shift that we picked up. Remember, when you make this 2 pi rotation, also in the semi-classical description, you pick up a e to the i pi phase shift uh, when you do this 2 pi rotation. So it means you basically come out at minus G comma 1. Okay, so you picked up a minus sign. Now, if there was no photon in the cavity, if you're entering with g, comma 0 into the cavity, well, then there's just going to be no dynamics. Remember, vacuum Rabi oscillations only occurred when the atom was in the excited state. Here, the atom is in the ground state, g, and it, when there's no photon in the cavity, the atom will exit again in the state g, comma 0. And now I think you can already get the hint of what we're doing here. We're imprinting a phase shift onto the atomic states 
if there is a photon in the cavity and we're having a vanishing phase shift if there's no photon in the cavity. So you see we're actually doing the exactly opposite of what you typically do in a Marxinda interferometer. In a Marxinda interferometer for light you can detect the presence of matter of a thin glass plate by making it introduce a phase shift onto the light field. Here we're doing the opposite. Here we're imprinting a phase shift onto the atom induced by the light field. And now we have to detect that phase shift and we're going to do that by introducing our final beam splitter, which is our final pi over 2 pulse in our atomic Marzinda interferometer, the Ramsey interferometer. So we have another pi over 2 pulse here in this zone R2, which converts the phase shift into a readable population transfer in the states I and G. So let's go through this in detail again and look at the different cases we have. So let's say we start out with an atom in state G and we put it into a superposition of G and I by the first pi over 2 pulse in the first Ramsey zone. Okay? Now this atom interacts with the cavity. If it's in state I, nothing's going to happen. The cavity is off resonant, no interaction. If it's in state G, but there's no photon, so we're in state G, 0, we're entering into the cavity, uh, we're going to exit the cavity in G, 0, nothing's going to happen. Okay, so now nothing's going to happen, so now you apply a final pi over 2 pulse on the GI transition here with your Ramsey zone 2, and now you ask yourself in which state are you going to exit, in state G or state I? Do you remember? Well, of course, 2 pi over 2 pulses, they're just like 1 pi pulse, so actually you're going to exit in state I, so the population for being in state G is going to be zero at this point if you're on resonance. But what's going to happen now if you actually have one photon in the cavity? So here's the kind of picture for that. So again you make the superposition state. Now you come into the cavity, but now you come into the cavity with G1. And remember we tuned the interaction time in the cavity such that for the single photon state we made a 2 pi rotation. So we're going to go to the ground state, to the excited state, and back to the ground state again. But now we're going to be in the state minus g, 1 here. So now in the superposition state between g and i, we've picked up a minus sign in that superposition state, which meant in our Bloch sphere picture in the equatorial plane, the superposition state on the gi Bloch sphere that we can think of has now been rotated by 180 degrees induced by this pi phase shift. And now when we apply the final pi over 2 pulse, we're going to actually have the atom not exit in the I state, but the atom come out in the G state again. So now the atom comes out in a G state. So now the only thing you have to do in your detector in the end is to detect whether the atom is, comes out in state G. If it comes out in state G, we had a single photon in the cavity and we still have it in the cavity. Yeah? Or if the atom emerges in the um, state I, then we did not have a photon in the cavity. Okay? So just by reading out the final atomic state, we can tell whether there was a photon in the cavity or not. And you see here the photon was kind of absorbed but emitted again into the cavity, so the photon stays in the cavity but it imprinted this important pi phase shift onto our atomic states and the final pi over 2 pulse allows us to read this out in the experiment. And here's indeed the experimental result for that. So if you have no photon in the system then you have the atom exiting in state I and if you have a single photon in your cavity setup you get this pi phase shift, you get the Ramsey fringes pi out of phase, you exit on this upper core. And with that you can really see whether there was a photon in the cavity without actually absorbing it, destroying it. It's still in the cavity after you've measured it. You can actually check that. They did that in the paper and I urge you to go and read the paper. So if you measure the photon again, you will find there is a single photon in that cavity. So isn't that a beautiful application of everything we've learned in this course? Ramsey interferometers, quantized light field interaction, cavity QED, putting it all together to finally form something beautiful where you can actually detect a photon without destroying it. Thanks a lot for watching and I'll see you in the next class.